Oh, you're watching or listening to Salon Soul Brothers and Sisters Hump of the Week 7 at 7 archive interview with today's guest Mark O'Keefe of Brown Sugar and Sugar Culture. Good evening, Salon Soul Brothers and Sisters, and welcome to another Hump of the Week 7 at 7. I think I better take these out. The sun is going in a little bit. And here I am, and you're probably wondering why I'm on my virtual tour of the world. I'm in the beautiful island of Mauritius, and I'm in this beautiful, surrounded by sugar everywhere. And I just thought, look, the man I'm interviewing tonight, he's got sugar all coming out of every vein in his body. I better be as sweet as him. So I just thought, surround me with sugar. So tonight's guest is Mr. Mark O'Keefe of Sugar Culture. And a little bit about this, I always say young man, Mark, but you're not that young anymore because <laughs> I neither am I. But Mark's career started with Peter Mark, you know, his dad is a great influence on my career. Frank was the general manager and uh, his, his career propelled fairly quick as far as I can remember. And then you outgrew the company, and decided that time to go on your own and developed Brown Sugar back in 2005. The very first uh, makeup and hair experience along with Paula Callan you just took, you just hit the ground running. You just really flew it, flew it, you know? And then from that, you grew that into a whole culture, which is sugar culture, brown sugar, sugar cube, sugar daddy, sugar coated, any more sugar, it's behind me. I don't think you've left anything else behind. Multi awards, but the one I want to talk about is, which is probably the dream for any salon owner, it was in 2018 at the L'Oreal Colour Trophy. I remember being there and I've been blown away by it. You, the, the lads coming out playing on the drums, the bagpipes, the, it was just amazing. And I went, Jesus, what a show. And that show went on to win international awards. But on that night, not allowing to just win the show, he's won everything. He's won the Gents Award, he's won the, the Colour Trophy. And that's just the tip of the iceberg of where this company has come. And I've really, really wanted to get Mark on for, for a long time. And now I have him because he's... He, when you say steeped in, in sugar and steeped in culture, his whole, his, in, his whole life is steeped in our industry of hairdressing. And it's just great to have you here, Mark. So on that note, I'll let you chip in there with a hello. Thanks, Greg. Um, there's not much more to say, really, is there? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I thought the picture behind you, I thought you were going to get me out of here and bring me on holidays or something. <laughs> I didn't know where we were going with that. Yeah, I just thought it's the only way I'm going to get to see the world at the moment, and that's to yeah. actually do it on every, you know. So sometimes I'm back to our beautiful Dublin, and sometimes I'm abroad. You know what I mean? Yeah. This week, I've this, well, actually, the one that's just gone out previous two weeks, we've been in Madison Square Garden, then I've been on stage in, in New York, and, and, and now here we are, you know, in a few no, no, no. Fair play, <laughs> <you>. well done. <laughs> so, thanks for having me on. Yeah. We're not, obviously, our show doesn't go out live, so this is recorded back. We're in, we're in March at the moment, so we're still in a grey area as to guards when the opening date. But by the time yeah. this goes out, let's hope we have a date. You know what I mean? And we won't focus too much on that, Mark, because it's about you, and I wanted to get to know about sugar culture and, and the whole, how you came up with the idea and where it came from. So we'll start with your 4-7-7 seven seven question, yeah. and that's, why did you choose hairdressing as a career? Well, you alluded it into in the induction. Um, um, it's probably no great surprise. Um, my father was a hairdresser, as you pointed out. He had a great career in Peter Mark. He's retired now. Um, and I suppose myself and Frank, my brother, just watched him. Um, you know, we love him. We you know he's our hero. But you know, we watched him and his career and how much fun he seemed to be having. And uh, it just seemed like a really, really cool option. Um, we started part-time at 15 and fell in love with it straight away. Uh, he wouldn't let us leave school. We had to go on to do our leavings, um, which I think was actually, you know, really beneficial when I, later on when we came to be, you know, open my own salon, etc. cetera. But um, fell in love with it straight away. And as soon as I left school at 18, I went full-time and never looked back. And straight into hair and beauty. Was that the first salon? Yeah. So when I was part-time, I, I was in Rath Farnham, Peter Mark Rath Farnham Shopping Centre. So I did two or three years there, summers and Christmas, etc. I actually started off at 14 in the Peter Mark Laundry. Myself and Richard Keaveney. With, with, with Paul. With Paul. With Paul, yeah. yeah. But they, they threw us all in there because we wanted to go into salons. But we couldn't even reach the basins. Um and well, some might argue I can still barely reach a basin, but that's another. <laughs> that's another. But um, yeah, so they closed in the laundry for a couple of years, and then I went to Peter Mark Farm, and then full time in hair and beauty. 
uh, under Lisa Brown for many years. I was very lucky because Lisa, Lisa was a great manager, lover. You know, she was a very strong woman, and and you know, I started off as a trainee under her, and then I was a stylist under her, and then I became a trainee manager under her. So, yeah, there were, it was great. There was a great salon at the time, and unfortunately, this year they decided they're closing it down. Yeah, yeah. You have the memories, Mark, and that's the yeah. great thing we have, you know, from our, our brilliant years with Peter Mark. The other thing I want to dip into a little bit, because it's something I've always saw, uh, done, and I was doing a talk there recently on the Speak Up, uh, an international company, and they were saying that, um, you know, I, I was saying that, you know, one of the things that stuck, I think it was Tony Robbins said it, if you want to be successful, meet successful people. And I think, would Gary Kavanagh have been that for you? Like, at the time, Gary was, a, you know, an iconic figure in hairdressing. <clears throat> And he had to be in hair and beauty. So I think I re- did you say at some stage you felt that was a that was a good move? I, I was very lucky. I mean, Gary Cabinet is still a very, very good friend of mine. I, I ring him every single day to just talk to a touch base with him and see how he's getting on. Um, but I was very lucky that Gary took me under his wing yeah. um and trained me because I wasn't easy to train, you know. Like I think a lot a lot of guys will probably understand where I'm coming from, you know. I wouldn't have had the most nimble of fingers. And when I started hairdressing, yeah, when, when I started hairdressing, perming was still a thing. And 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 we had, I couldn't perm. I just couldn't get my head around putting in rollers. Uh, so I, I remember kicking the trolley one day in classes and Dennis was teaching classes and storming out and going home and literally cried to my dad saying I was going to give it up. But I went back. And I'm going to put on that with Mark because I was downstairs in Mary Street. I'd just done my perming exam. And I was standing doing one of my very first perms. And who comes down, down the stairs? Your dad. Oh, no. And you know the way he could stand watching you? Yeah. Yeah. I turned with two rollers in and knocked the whole trolley over them. Oh, he soon went up the stairs. I think he thought, leave the fella alone. <laughs> yeah. Well, like that was the first, so, you know, perming. And then we had to do the little sausage blow rise. Remember, everything was really small yeah, yeah. brushes. And like, I just couldn't get my fingers to work. So uh, that was a big struggle. But then obviously Gary got a hold of me you know, training-wise, and uh, he taught me how to cut hair, he taught me how to blow dry hair, and then colouring as well, but that was a big saviour, because colouring, I took the colouring much much easier, as did Frank, because my dad was a colourist as well, so uh, from that point of view, that was a big saviour, um, but Gary was definitely a huge help for me. Yeah, and then you, you went on, you, you worked there as a stylist. Yeah, after I graduated, I was lucky, Lisa took me back as a where stylist. Where was your first management position then? So, at 20. Four, just 23, 24, I was, um, I was asked to manage Bloomfield Shopping Centre in Dunleary. Bloomfield just opened up. And I went out there to manage that. And I managed that for three years, three and a half years. And then the position came available in Hair and Beauty to manage Hair and Beauty. So I threw my name in the hat and I was lucky enough to give me a go with that. And it's I managed a, that for a few years. Very similar to yourself. I, I was out. Suburbs, Northside Shopping Centre, yeah. cutting your teeth basically. Yeah. And I remember Blanchestown, and then your dad came out and they had the offer to go back to Mary Street to go back to where you started. Exactly. And it is a strange experience to go in and manage people who you looked up to. Oh, yeah. You know I mean? Like that's, and I think, it, you know, it probably made us probably better managers today. <laughs> you know what I mean? For it, you know? Well, you had to be on your A game, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. You know, and you managed there for how many years was that, Mark? God, I was probably 27 when I went back in there and I opened up maybe 28. No, about 27 because I got married at 28 and I was still was there. So probably went back in there 27. And I opened Brown Sugar in 2005 and I was tw- 33 then. Right, so Len, we'll dip into that then because you've led lovely into the second okay. question. Why? Because you were earning good money. Your dad yeah. was in a great position within the... Yeah. Is probably the biggest and best company that's ever come out of Ireland, Peter Mark. You know, Absolutely, we'll all yeah. hold our hands up and say that. You know what I mean? What made you become want to become a salon owner? I, I loved Peter Mark, you know, and I suppose when my dad being the general, general manager and a director at that stage, and a very, very close relationship with the Keeneys, like Richard Keeney was and still is a very good friend of mine. I, I did genuinely see think I was going to just have a career path right the way through. My early ambitions, I was hoping that I'd be the first non keeney managing director of the company. And I kind of, you know, I was, I was very much focused on that. Um, then, you know, the, the likes of Zoo opened up. Hmm. And because I mean, you'd know this from PMs, it's very much you're in the bubble. And yeah. you, don't, you, you didn't really look outside, you know, it only kind of mattered what was going on at PMs. 
And then Zoo came along and that really turned my head because Shay and Andy were doing great work. Um, you know, and they were getting to travel a lot and they were doing, they were, you know, doing a lot of really nice editorial work and stuff. And that just got me thinking about looking outside the company. Didn't it? And then Tony and Guy came along. And when Tony and Guy came to Dublin, I, I have to be honest with you, like it just it blew my mind. You know, the hairdressing that was come, going around, the, the, new, the new haircuts, the new colour, the people working there. It just had a lot more kind of rock star, rock style yeah, kind yeah. of feel to it, didn't it? Yeah, it was now. You know, and then I'll never forget the, the first time I saw a House of Colour at the L'Oreal Colour Trophy. And that was like an out of rock concert, you know what I mean? Like we were all sitting there like this and they're over there wrecking the place, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I just remember thinking, oh man, I want some of this. Mm. And, and that's really where my motivation came from. And, 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 and uh, yeah, I just kind of thought then, like, you know, if I stay in PMs, I'm going to become an area manager and then I'll get 10 salons where I'm looking after 10 managers' problems but I'm not doing the stuff I love. I'm not working with people on the floor. I'm motivating them and them motivating me. And, you know, the creative juice is going back and forth. And so I just thought, yeah. And then I was with Paula. Paula is and was then as well, just an amazing makeup artist. Mm. And I just saw an opportunity for us to do something different and to do hair and makeup at the highest level. And uh, that was the easy bit. The hard bit was convincing Paula to leave Mac. You know, she was on their worldwide art team. She was traveling around the world six, you know, six months of the year, going to all the fashion shows and fashion weeks and whatever. So it wasn't easy to convince Paula to give that up and come work with me. I'd have loved to be, well, that that's the husband and wife thing. That was one thing. <laughs> I'd love to be not flying the wall when you broke it to your dad. <laughs> mm. You know, and I've never told anyone this, Greg. Um, my dad was more, you know, he, he never would talk me out of it, right? But he made it very clear, very clear from the very first conversation that there was a conflict of interest there, that he was the general manager and, and director of Peter Mark, a company that he'd worked with his whole life, um, and that his responsibility was to protect the salons. So he made it very clear from the get-go, but he wished me the best of luck that he couldn't have any involvement in, in any shape or form. And it wasn't until he retired from Peter Mark, which was 10, 10, 11 years ago, that he became very active behind the scenes with me. And, and has been a, you know, an incredible help to me in recent years, in the last 10 years. But, but in fair, and it's something I really respect about him. You know, he knew that, that he had a lifestyle, thankfully, a really good lifestyle, thanks to Peter Mark. He had a really good pension, thanks to Peter Mark. And he wasn't going to jeopardize that just because I wanted to do something different. Great answer. And, 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 and I expected that. Because yeah. I know you that that well, you know yeah. what I mean. Deal of, I always remember. Actually, one day I think I I, I had a client who worked in Jemison at the time, so it was a great deal on Jemison. And I always met, said I always wanted to thank Frank. I never really got to thank him when I lived for for the good stuff, which was been tough love that he gave yeah. me. And he he was uh, maybe of a different ilk. We probably wouldn't get away with it now. But I remember sending him in a bottle, eighteen year old, with his name Jemison, saying. Give that to your, your dad. You know, I don't even remember it. You know, but he did. He did come up to me and say, "Thanks very much for the whiskey, Craig. It was lovely." You know, no, my dad would never forget anyone who gives him a bottle of whiskey. Huh? <laughs> my dad would never forget anyone who gives him a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't Bush Mills because Black Bush was always his favourite tip. Black Bush is his favourite. Well, I'm going to rephrase this question because at the last, I, I put when I put these seven together, it was probably a different. It was when the force locked down, and I'm slowly evolving them a little bit. And I'm kind of somebody who likes to look back on the good things, learn from the bad things, but don't dwell on the bad ones so long. But we've got lots of wisdom about us. You know what I mean? So the next question I want to ask, if you were looking back on how you started Brown Sugar and you want to advise a new generation or a new person that was setting off on that journey, what do you think you might do differently or what would you recommend them to do differently? Again, in your introduction, Greg, you, you touched on this as well. Um, when we opened our salon, it just it just lit, you know. Um, we were very lucky. Two thousand and five, the Celtic Tiger was roaring, and people were looking for something different. Um, Paula had great connections with the press as well, so like we didn't have a slow start, if anything. And and and, and you, you know, I still have, I'm still that's still one of my salons today. I love this spot in South William Street. It's a great big space. It's very quirky. It's you know, it has a lot of uniqueness to it. Um, but we were very successful with a very good team from the get-go. Uh, so from my point of view, opening my business then and opening a business now is night and day. Yeah. You know, when, yeah. when, we, when we open salons now and we're in, we're in the middle of a 
trying to open a new bar, but it's, it's so much more challenging, so much more difficult to get a really good team. Um, you know, to, to try and build clientele now is so much more of a struggle. Just to create PR as well. I mean, social media is great, right? Instagram is great, but it's flooded. It's, you know, everyone is using it now. Yeah. So yeah. it's so hard to stand out and be different today. Where back then it was so much easier. You know, you got a couple of articles in a few newspapers and you were gone, you know, it was, it was just amazing. So, so like looking back in 2005 to compare to, to, to opening a salon now, it's, more, it's far more challenging today. Yeah, in good and bad, you know, in good ways. And, and the challenges are good because as you and I were talking off camera that, you know, the way salon was operated 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 20, it's, it's totally different. And then, Five years, well, not even 12 months' time. They're probably yeah. totally different. Oh, they? absolutely. COVID is going to change everything. But if it wasn't like that, we wouldn't be in it. No, 100%. And that's what I love about it. Like, no two days are the same. Um, you know, misogynistic thing. It's totally kind of like, the, oh, it's going to be tougher. Yeah, we'll go for it. You know, grand, yeah, come on. Why not? Why not? Let's keep going. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because yeah. what else? Because it is a brilliant industry. And what else would we do? You know? Exactly, yeah. So I'm going to lead on to your next question. And that's, one that I love because I, I love the, the answers I get from people and it's what makes an amazing salon in Marco Keefe's eyes. Yeah. And like a lot of the people have been on to say, we, we say similar kind of things and because it's not rocket science, obviously our salons are only as good as the people that are working in them, but it's, I think it's another level to it as well. And we talk a lot about culture, but it, it's, it's the ethos of your company. It's the ethos of your salon. And you need people to buy into that. And David Campbell spoke about it and how Sakola, they try and bring as many people through. They try and train as many people in to positions. We do something very similar. And in, and in the past, like I've recruited great hairdressers, like amazing hairdressers. Some I've gone after, some have come to me. And sometimes it just doesn't work because they just don't get it. Or maybe they don't like it. So I think... A great salon is a combination of not just great people, but them believing in what you're trying to do, them wanting your, they want the business to succeed because they know that they will succeed within the business as well. So I think, I think they're the, the clubs that need to come together for it to really make a great salon. Yeah, brilliant answer. All right. Leading now, we're, well, we're rocking through this. <laughs> we're rocking through it. Before the sun goes down, get <laughs> <laughs> What cocktail do they have over there? Huh? What cocktails do they drink over there? Whatever you ask for. Okay, <laughs> I I would imagine uh, it's plenty plenty of sugar, sugar and syrup in them. Anyway. <laughs> oh, he knows. So the next thing I want to ask, and I call this now me Jenny Jenny Smullen uh, question, right? Okay. Because when I asked her, she came back with a great answer, and she says, "There's people who are mentors to me, and there's people who inspire me." Mm. I went, "Wow, you've changed that question forever more." So. Looking back on your career, who were the people you feel were great mentors or great inspiration or still are? Well, I think, and I think that's great because I agree with her at the second half of the question because it's, for me, it's about inspiration. I mean, my dad obviously was a great mentor and Gary Kavanagh, who we also touched on. They're two people that I would say in my whole career, I owe, I owe something to, you know. I, I, don't, I don't feel I owe anyone else anything. I worked hard. I got, I got paid well and I worked hard, so I don't feel I owe anyone anything, but my dad and, my, and Gary went above and beyond. Another person who was very good to me in the early days was Ivan Bischoff from Royale, as you know well. Um, you know, he put an arm around me. We were Ivan yesterday in our filing cabinet, uh, giving Alison her uh, L'Oreal colour degree, Alice, my wife, and it was himself and Pauline, I think it was, at the, remember the Scottish girl? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and I said that, I, and funny enough, Duncan Kenna only said to me the other day, I never really got to know Ivan. He was, God, he was a very respected guy. And I went, he was a gent. He was just well, a an absolute man. gentleman. Lovely man. Absolutely yeah. lovely man. So great, to, great that you mentioned him as well, you know? Yeah, well, Ivan was one of the few, you know, he would have certainly put an arm around me in the early days. He used to come in on a regular basis, you know, have a cup of coffee with me, bring me out, shoot the breeze. You know, he listened to me and my woes. If I had any or any concerns, I mean, you, had, you know what I mean? In a really nice way. Very kind man. Um, but I think, like, I'm not a great man for sitting down with, you know, like the likes of Alan Austin Smith or anything like that. I, I feel I'm already very highly motivated. And I, I, not that I don't want to learn. I just, I, I, I'm inspired by other salons, genuinely, right? and their success. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the people who own them. But just, you know, to see other salons do well 
gives me a buzz. And, and you know, I, t- I touched on like the first time House of Colour and I saw them screaming and, you know, the atmosphere. They're the things that make me want to be better and make me want to make sure that, you know, I'm not left behind. So great salons in, in, in Dublin, in the country, across the UK, they're the ones that inspire me um, because I suppose there's just so many great brands out there that have achieved so much. And, you know, you just want, I want to make sure that we're always in that mix. Oh, and, you know, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> The, the evolution of the brand itself, it just goes to show that you're not a sitting your laurels kind of person, you know? No. So, when we look back on the crazy, it, it seems never ending now to keep saying this. I thought I'd have buried this question a long time. But looking back on the last year where we've had more, more than half a year off work, mm. you know I mean? and we've had to look back, and what I've done is looked at the glass half full moments within that year that I've kind yeah. of, well, had I been head down behind a chair walking away that never would have happened so is there any of you any of them that might you might share with us well the, the most obvious one for me greg right i mean obviously my 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 day my working day has changed massive massively right over the years where you know when we first opened the salon like everybody else i was behind the chair hoping to be booked out three four five six weeks in advance um and I'm just, you know, trying to just do my best to generate as much income for the business. And then I've, over the years, we opened set more and more salons. So my role changed to one where obviously I'm managing a business. So you have so many different uh, areas that you need to focus on. So up until COVID, at the most, I was doing three days. But some days, I was, some weeks, I was doing two days hairdressing. Certainly every Friday and Saturday. And I tried to do some on a Thursday. Um, when, co- after, when we reopened after the first lockdown, the biggest shock that I got was we lost about 10 stylists across the group. Um, we lost managers, we lost style, senior stylists, we lost um, colorists, we lost a couple of uh, junior stylists. So that was a big blow. So I suppose the half full moment was for me is that I was able to get behind the chair again. Yeah, yeah. And I was able to roll my sleeves up. I was able to do six days, seven days hairdressing. Um, and, and not only did I enjoy it, I was pretty damn good at it too. Yeah. <laughs> so, so um, you know, I was very grateful that I was able to do that. Um, by the time Christmas came around, you know, everything had leveled off again and we got things back on track and I was able to kind of come back a little bit more and do some more management type of work again. But I was so grateful at a time where we were under pressure that I was able to roll my sleeves up and get stuck in. And that's it. Like I, I recently, my, my parents are elderly, so my sister was coming over and she normally gets her, her hair done in a, a straight with black amber because she lives over in Ace. Mm. And I, she said, I said to her, do you want your hair cut? Seriously, Greg? And I said, well, look, it's your, we're around me, mum and dad. We now are careful. Mm. I said, sit in the kitchen, we'll do it. And I got so much of a buzz. <laughs> there was lovely well. situated Bob took me, t- I said, don't want to take me time. And it actually, because you do get that fear. Can I forget this? Yeah. You no. Know? And I actually, at my stage of career, thought I wouldn't miss cutting hair, but we actually do. You know what I mean? We do. I know you do. That uh, the, the term I remember, I think I learned it from three six five, and they were saying is, you know, do hair because you choose to do it, not because you have to do it. Right. So I think a lot of us who are <clears> hairdressers, you know what I mean, will never want to give that up. So we'll like Mark. Mark Keaveney used to go into Valentino's. I remember yeah. Paul was manager. Yeah. And Paul Every was, Friday. You know, and do a haircut or two. You know why? Because he still want to do it. You know what I mean? That's what that's what made us what we were. That's what got you noticed. And you don't want to give it up. And I think it's great that you you actually did get in behind the chair. And I think it, it's it's a great example to the to the people who work for you. That yeah. You, you know what I mean? And that you're not above. Hold on, I can show. I can get in here and walk in with it when you when I have to. But you don't yeah. always have to. You know. But I just want to elaborate a little bit on that, Mark. Where do you feel this? This because you weren't the first person to say that after lockdown, people didn't come back. So where did you feel they went? Well, it was a combination of a few things. It was three people who just happened to be on mat leave, so that was just you know just the way it fell. Um, we had two people. One was nervous, and one had to look after a family member, and then the rest went chasing black market. Yeah. Simple the, the shadow economy the that. shadow economy whatever you want to call it now oh, i know i know but it's funny actually because i just i was talking to a salon owner around me on sunday and basically they said yes they just stylists that didn't want to, i can't come back and then all of a sudden he's heard that 
they're out there working in the shadow economy. And I think yeah. it's the one thing that we, this goes out to the UK, goes out everywhere, that us as salon owners want is, we want the government to remember what we've sacrificed for this year and give us the support for at least a year to help us get the industry back to where it should be. Because we're all, everybody say we're going to be busy, be out the door. and the, Yeah, we know. But we can fall off a cliff like that. But you know, Greg, it'll come back because, you know, at the moment, it's, it's, it's a, it is a certain level of desperation. Right? Clients are desperate to get their hair done. Yeah. yeah. And, and stylists are desperate to look after their clients. Yeah. And to hold on to them because, you know, we're nothing without our clients. So if you've spent, it doesn't matter if you spent five years or 25 years looking after someone, you don't want to lose that client. So she's asking you, I really want to get my hair done. Can you please help me out? You know, the people are nervous to say no because they might, she might not come back, right? So there's an element of that that I think when this is all over, it'll level off. But more importantly, good hairdressers, they don't want to work in someone's kitchen. They mm. want to be seen on a salon floor. The salon floor is their platform. It's their stage. You know, it's their opportunity to be able to show everybody how good we are. I can't do that in someone's kitchen. No. So, so sooner or later, people, and I really genuinely believe this, all the great hairdressers are going to come back. I genuinely believe that. And, it, and, and that's and even just down like the simple thing like I done my sister's hair in the kitchen mm. but the reason it took me so long is that the lighting in your kitchen is not the lighting in the salon <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, hang on I just double check that we back, back went twice we back went twice for the shampoo and the sink ring light I only had a ring light to actually throw the light on I went great thank god for the ring light I would have been lost yeah. so yeah. we're we, we show people and, and the best part let's face it you don't turn up in somebody's living room to put on a performance you know what i mean exactly. and as much as the weekend they're there a couple of weekends ago i enjoyed watching niall colgan doing it doing a set yeah in my living room why well because i couldn't go out anywhere so it's the next best thing and exactly. i find on saturday nights now we tune into a, a hairdresser that works for occasions and her husband go live from eight to ten <laughs> and yeah. then of niall colgan then if he's on again from ten to twelve and i go that's it's in but it's it's in but it's out the yeah, but like a yeah, good example. I mean, Niall, Niall loved doing that gig and he had a great time. But where do you think he'd rather be in a nightclub doing it with oh, yeah. three or four hundred people screaming at him? Yeah. You know, or in a bit in his kit in his shed on his own. Just, you know, people, we love an audience. We love performing. Yeah, you know, and that's what I feel. We are look. I, I honestly feel life will get back to normal eventually. You know what I mean? And people will want to go out, out, out. Yeah, out, out. They want to look good going out. So we're gonna make them look good. You know what yeah, I mean? Exactly. So just that as long as the government give us the support and as long as, like I've said it to my guys that work with me, look, you you make that moral decision when you want to do hair outside of here. I can't. I'm, I'm, I'm asked to close my business not to police this. It's not my job to police it. No. 100%. My job is that to be open is to blow the customer out of the water and get them back on board. Exactly. And people come back and go, oh, I like working there. I missed it. You know? So what? The, it's all in term at the moment, but we'll get back and I... You know, can't wait to see what's going to happen next for Sugar Culture, which leads me on to my seventh question. <laughs> is What would you like the future to hold for your business? Or what have you, the type of guy you are, you have plans. I know you'd have plans. Yeah, we're, we're currently opening a new barber's in um, Georgia Street Arcade. So that'll bring us up to three sugar daddies. It'll bring us back up to seven salons. Well, you, so the one around the corner from where you are, literally. In Shaker Street, it was our first barber's, right? But it's a, it's a nice four-seater barber shop. So you like... It's booked out every day. Yeah. So we're taking over uh, a, a little space in the George Street Arcade and we're putting another little four-seater barbers in there. And one of the best um, landlords in Dublin. She's an unbelievable landlord. <laughs> I she's, to honestly, her. God, she's a, a brilliant family, family, thank God. That woman is just, yeah. it, it broke the mold. You don't get many really? like I know, because we so she wouldn't really rub off a few people. You feel the vibe when you go through that little arcade. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, it's both it hasn't changed. Hasn't changed in 30 years. Oh, Probably no. longer, but I only remember the last 30. <laughs> and what else have you got as, as regards training with your team? And we're, 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 we're currently looking for a new space for Sugar Cubed, which is a salon we had to close down after the first lockdown. And we had, we, we had our institute was in that space as well. So that's something that we're actively trying to find is a new space for Sugar Cubed and our training space for our, for our institute or an or asylum, as it's become known within the company. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we hope to have that done in the next twelve months. 
And how do you find with the, the you you took part? You've signed up a couple of trainers for the new apprenticeship as well. I yeah, guess. we've got. I think we've got um, five on it in total. Um, <laughs> at the, at the, they all are thrilled. We've no, nothing but good things to say about it so far. Um, they're they're really enjoying the training. And obviously, at the moment, most of it's done online, so it's a very different experience. But so far, so good. Very, yeah. you know, it's early days, but so far, so good. My wife's just taken up as a position to teach you. So you know, I believe we're working with Kevin, yeah, that's great. 20 years ago, I went on the... Andy Drumgool coerced me on to join the IHF Executive Committee, which mm -hmm. I know you're an active member of now. Yeah, and yeah. He says, you're very passionate about an apprenticeship, Greg. You should come on board. And then when I stepped off after 20 years, I, I knew it was coming, but it wasn't there by the time I'd left. But it's just fantastic to finally say we have it, because you and I have travelled, Mark, and it's, you know, it was a bit of an embarrassment that when you meet all these other, like even in Eastern Bloc countries, you know what I mean? They had a proper structure for hairdressing. Exactly, and yeah. The industry was deemed worthy enough to have it. You know what I mean? And I think what's going to come out of this is that our industry is fantastic. And what I hope from the likes of these interviews is that we will, if we need to encourage young people to come in and why they should come in, just the answers I've had from that first question, why did you become a hairdresser? It's, you know, it was never about, I want, as I said to you, driving a flash car. Mm. Well, plenty of flash cars around. Plenty yeah. of flash motorbikes. I don't know whether you're a motorbike guy. <laughs> Bit of both. Have you? Yeah, well, well I'm, jo I'm, jo I'm the Vespa man. You know what I mean? Yeah. My, Vespa thing, my wife bought me Vespa five years ago, Mark, and I'm only get, seven years ago. And I gave it to two wrong people to do it up. They were both recovering alcoholics. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> and, uh, it never got done up. It just got ripped apart, and now I have a guy that's getting it done. So I hope someday to go out and join Paul Stafford up the north on a run around. Very good. You know, uh, you know wherever he'll take me. You know what I mean? I'll be happy enough with that. So on the front of the you, you, what you have now, do you ever see yourself moving beyond Dublin city centre, south side, and outside that side? Do you see yourself going? Cork, Limerick, or beyond across the water, because it's a very strong brand you have, Mark. And I know the type of guy you are that you kind of go, well, we could do it, you know. You know, the dream is always go to the UK. I always thought, um, and we've we've had discussions with people in, about opening our brands in the UK. I always thought, you know, pick a nice area and drop all the brands into one small area. So rather than having them scattered all over the place, mm -hmm. I kind of use the analogy of a, a pond, and you drop a a pebble into a bottom pond, you know, you want to see the ripples moving out and, and as you know, in the best possible way. So I would have loved to open in the UK. Um, just, it just always seems to be something happens, right? The first recession came along, that obviously set things back. We're just getting back on top of things and then COVID comes along. So it's going to take a while for that to recover and for us to get back on our feet again. Um, but I would love to open in the UK. I'm just, yeah. I'm, I'm getting close to 50, Greg, you know what I mean? I need to get a move on. Yeah, so you're only, you know, you're only a kid. But the thing is, you, once the brand is like, and, and that's what I'm saying is, you built a strong brand. You know what yeah. I mean? There was a stage in my career I would have thought, yeah, we'd like to go, but then other things came along and it just never it wasn't to be. And and probably because I don't have the patience to have decided one salon, but I like selling hairbrushes, but I also like selling online, but I also like uh, teaching people. So I'm kind of caught between a lot of different things. But I think the sugar culture. And what the whole brand you have, I think it deserves to be broadened out. You know what I mean? And I always felt that, you know, when I used to go to L'Oreal years ago and they'd ask about Peter Mark and they'd go, who are they? And I go, seriously? And then you'd get a technician from L'Oreal go, you don't know what this company's like. And I thought, you know, if Peter Mark had gone into the UK, they would have, and I think they were at one stage and then a recession came at that time and they decided not to. But if you look even down to Forest, mm. like I take great pride that I remember Ronan coming into me as, with glasses on him and a young kid and he just bought over, I can't even think the name of the brand he bought and we, he was going from beauty into hair and he had a vision and a dream and he kind of went, yeah, will that ever happen? And I remember Shortcuts, our dealer company was saying, oh, they, they're testing you out on everything. And I left them for a little while, but I always felt I missed it because I loved Sue. Do you remember Sue? Of course it was Sue, yeah. yeah. I met Sue or something and we came back. And I just, I take great pride when I go and say, Forest, they're, they're Irish, based in Cable Street. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so it's massive. And then right, lately, David Donnelly. Yeah, he's going to move. Yeah, he's he's taken out from Parf into London. And yeah. he's kind of going, yeah, we always used to think everything had to come from the UK over. 
But now we can go the other way. The only thing is we just might have a bit of exercise on it. But, but <laughs> that's the beauty of air industry is you can do it and Brexit doesn't have a bearing on it at all. Yeah. You just set it up as a complete British-based... Co- bi- of course, yeah, 100%. Yeah, that's fantastic. So is there anything else you have to add, Mark? Because it's been really enjoyable. No, Very little talk <laughs> about your brother. What was that? Very little talk about your brother who taught my wife her colour degree. <laughs> oh, but see, yeah, no, we're, we're delighted to have Frank on board. Frank le- left L'Oreal after 19 years and joined the company. So you can imagine, you know, the, the, the level of uh, professionalism he's brought to, to especially our colouring techniques and our training. But Frank's another one as well. Like, obviously, he rolled up his sleeves after COVID in the first lockdown and, and you know, got behind the chair as well. And you know, I'm very grateful to, for the likes of Patrick and, and Jill, who's yeah. Patrick's the COO and Jill's the area manager who kind of allowed us to do that because they just took over the day-to-day running of the company. But um, no, I think what you're doing is great, Greg. I love watching them. It's great to see so many people and faces that I've known uh, for you know over the years growing up, especially in our PM days. Yeah. Uh, and you know to see their stories and listen to their stories, it's, it's been great. Really, really good. So well done. Well, there we go. The bar will be calling me in this beautiful island. <laughs> I think it's Ryan forecast for yourself there, Mark. Probably. Uh, I'll just carry on That's with new. the virtual sunshine here. <laughs> Although I did have a growth move, so I shouldn't really be in the sun, you know. Okay. So, to Mark O'Keefe of the wonderful sugar culture, continued success to you. I love watching what you do. I think you're an inspiration to everybody and every young salon owner out there who wants to go beyond just having the one salon. But if you want one, take it from me, it doesn't matter. It's Everything is cooked, but this man has led the way in showing us what can be done and will continue to do it. So to all my fellow Salon Soul brothers and sisters out there, may the hair force be with you till we meet again. Take care. Thanks, Greg. Thank you for listening to our interview with Mark O'Keefe of Brown Sugar and Sugar Culture. Well, if you got this far, we must be doing something right. So please don't keep this to yourself. Don't forget to like, share, comment and give us a five star review. And please share all our social media and channels. It helps us a lot. Thank you.